my name is Chad Peterson, and I serve as the lead pastor at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and I want to personally welcome you to this online worship opportunity. Wherever you are today, and whenever you are gathered to be with us, know that you are welcome just as you are, which is exactly the way that Jesus welcomed people in his ministry. And so gathered together today, we begin our time in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last month, we heard how the story of our faith is a story about belonging, that we are better together, and it is God's dream for the world that we would come to see each other as God sees us, as a common humanity, as loved and accepted regardless of religion, race, nationality, and anything else that can be used to determine who belongs and, well, who does not. If we believed that, if we believed that we all belong, that we all had value, that we all mattered, the world would be changed for the better. It really would. This month, as we move to another topic, the story of our faith is a story also about the unexpected journey, as we will see through the story of Joseph. So much of what happens to us in life, we do not get to choose. We end up in places we never expected, and yet it is exactly on that road that we did not plan to go down that we find God is walking with us. 
I don't think I've ever told you about the story of my, my wedding. <laughs> and I'm going to because it relates to our focus text, to where the story of Joseph is taking us today. Emily and I got engaged the summer of my senior year in college, which was her first summer after graduation. <laughs> that makes me sound so old, at least I think it does. Uh, you know, the median age for engagement in our country right now for males is something like 28 years old. I mean, I, I think I was 21 at the time, which is way too young to make a decision like that. I was a stupid kid. What, what did I know? Anyway, you should know that I am a very organized, attention to detail kind of person. I always have been. My Clifton Strengths profile leads with discipline. The description of that strength reads as follows. Your world needs to be predictable. It needs to be ordered and planned so you instinctively impose structure on your world. You set up routines. You focus on timelines and deadlines. You break long-term projects into a series of specific short-term plans and you work through each plan diligently. You are not necessarily neat and clean. Oh, but I am that as well. But you do need precision. Oh, doesn't that sound beautiful? Absolutely. So because of both of our personalities, Emily and I had everything arranged. Every detail was planned out. Even the date was strategic. At that point, I knew I was going to seminary. I knew I was going to graduate school. And the school that I was planning to attend had required classes that began in the first part of the summer. So July 26 was three days after I would be done with summer classes, which gave us plenty of time to get married, have a honeymoon, and be, and be back for the start of fall semester. Oh, it was perfect. Everything was planned out so far in advance. It was beautiful until, until I visited the school I was planning to go to and decided it wasn't for me and decided to go to a different seminary whose required summer classes were not at the beginning of the summer, but instead were at the end. And because everything, and I mean everything, was so organized and dates were arranged, our wedding date could not be changed. <laughs> so, here is how it went down. I moved to Dubuque, Iowa to begin my required summer class. The second week of class, I took a test on Friday, drove back to Nebraska for the rehearsal dinner, got married on Saturday, and went back to Dubuque on Sunday so I could go to class on Monday. I mean, when people were sharing about their weekend, some said that they just relaxed, others went to a winery. When someone asked me and, and said something like, Chad, well, what did you do this weekend? I said, well, I got married. <laughs> I win, right? Emily and I joke about this now, but we didn't when we were going through it. I, I remember someone said to us, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It will all work out. This was God's plan for you all along. Now, uh, I mean, I, I know comments like that are intended to be supportive, but I find them irritating. I mean, we did not find ourselves on this path that we were on because God put us there. Because God thought, hmm, Chad, I think you need more stress in your life. No, not at all. I firmly believe this. We were there because I am obsessive and compulsive and freaky organized and I jumped the gun and made decisions that were premature. People who are religious, who have a faith life, often believe, or I think more accurately, they think that they are supposed to believe that the path they are on in life is the one they're supposed to be on. It's the one that God has chosen for them. This is part of their understanding of what it means to have faith. 
And, and I guess I get that it's very comforting to believe that God is in control, moving you to the exact path that you should be on in life, especially when it feels like there are so many things that are out of our control. And this theology, God as a puppet master pulling all the strings of your life, it, I guess it works. I think it does. I, th I guess it works fine for many people that is until things go off the rails. A and then it becomes incredibly problematic. Uh, and I'll get there in a second, but, but first let's go back to the story of Joseph because it has something to say about all of this. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to the dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Then. Joseph heard them say, let's go down to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come, let's kill him and throw him in one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from, from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe that he was wearing, and they threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. The story of Joseph is found in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament. Genesis is a book about beginnings. It moves from the beginning of creation to the ordering of families and nations to the birthing of the fathers and mothers of Israel. The ancestral stories begin with Abraham and Sarah and go down the line, eventually focusing on the sons of Jacob, in particular, Joseph. So Genesis is, is a story about God being present in the beginning and God being present from then on and moving forward. It's a story about God's continued activity in the world. So, so as the author tells the story, the boy Joseph received an elegant coat from his father. He also had dreams which were interpreted and he would dream that the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down before him, which he interpreted and others interpreted as Joseph's family members bowing down before him. And his brothers become jealous. 
and they sell the boy into slavery in Egypt and, and place blood on his elegant coat to deceive their father into thinking that Joseph was dead. Now this is as far as we read in today's, in today's reading. This is, this is to the extent of Joseph's journey so far. And here is the question at the end of this that I want to ask you. It's an important question. How did Joseph end up on his unfortunate path? How did he end up in a pit, in a cistern? How did he end up being sold into slavery? How did his life go so wrong so quickly? Was it God's doing? Did God set him on that path? That is not what the author says. Joseph ends up in this awful circumstance because of the actions of his brothers, because of their self-righteous indignation, because of their jealousy, because of their envy, and because of their hate. The biblical writers do not tell a story about God wanting Joseph to suffer, about God pulling the strings, causing Joseph to go down the path where he is to be then sold as property while his father thinks he's dead. Oh, that is so important. Yeah, I don't want to kick dirt over all of someone's belief that God is directly responsible for the good path that they've been on, for the good life that they have lived, but I want to point out where this theology comes up short, why many people struggle with it, and why the biblical authors never really land there. I know someone who really wanted to be in the medical field, but after taking her MCAT, to not do very well, and actually said something to the degree that, that God was directing her, telling her that this was not her path, even though it was something that she was really passionate about. I, I don't think that's tr necessarily true. I, I think that God is saying, try again, study more. Try some more. I, I mean, I have heard of people, most often religious women, who stay with an abusive spouse because they believe that the path God has set them on is this, and that they are just supposed to accept that. I don't believe that. I mean, if you are being abused, get out. God does not want that for you. That, that is not the path God has put you on. Let's go deeper. I do not believe that God sets some Ukrainian civilians on the path to be tortured, killed, and dumped in a mass grave. I don't believe that God is the driving force or the causation behind the car accident that kills a family, a surgery gone wrong that takes a father, a marriage that falls apart, a miscarriage. I don't believe God is pulling strings to put some people on the path to uh, wealth and some people on the path to poverty. I mean, the story of Joseph is about God journeying with Joseph into the pit, into slavery. It is about God grieving with Joseph's father. The biblical story is a story of God walking with people and acting in the lives of people as they find themselves in celebration and in despair. The nature of God's love does not cause suffering in this world, but stands present with those that are suffering. I don't know where everyone is at on their path right now. It is always interesting and humbling for me to think about all of you who are here and engaging in this community of faith, whether you are in person or just engaging remotely. You all have such different lives and different paths. You are all in different places. Your joys and struggles are not the same. And yet, regardless of what your path looks like, they are all connected by, by faith. They are all connected by a faith that God walks with you down your path, wherever that might be. Your path in life is not set. It is not inevitable. Things happen. Actions have consequences. Other people can impact us for better and for worse. We can impact our own lives. And sometimes things just happen because, well, the world is messy and the world is unpredictable. 
The biblical story speaks of a God in such a way that God does not cause your suffering. God is not trying to teach you a lesson through the death of a loved one, through your grief, through your suffering. Instead, we have faith in a God who accompanies us walks with us, journeys with us down our path in life, and calls us to do the same with others. So today, may you find comfort and hope in a God who journeys with you, in your joys, in your struggles, not a God who creates them. This is the good news that we hear today so that we can go out and walk with people down their paths in life and help them to experience the love that God has for all of us. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. As a way of going deeper into the story, our focus text for this day, as well as the reflection on that, here are a couple of reflection questions to help you go deeper. Number one, spend some time reflecting on your life's journey. What are the top five best and worst moments? Can you name them? And number two, we have hope that God walks with us in our life, which is often felt in the love and support of others. How do you meet others in their life and walk with them, especially in their struggles? What does that feel like? If today's reflection relates to you in some way and you feel that it would be well received by others in your life, well, please feel free to share that with others. Also, if there is anyone in your life who you would like uplifted in our public prayers, then please either privately email us or leave their name in the comments and we will add them to our prayers. We thank you for taking time out of your busy day, out of your life, to watch, listen, and be uplifted in this service. Continuing to offer all of our ministry, both online and in person, is made possible only through your generosity, your support. If you feel that you're in a place to give of your time, talents, and treasures to the mission of this congregation, you can do so in a variety of ways. You can volunteer and participate in the life of this ministry, and you can find many of those opportunities through subscribing to our e-news, The Shooting Star. If you're in a place to give of your finances, you can do so through our website, through mailing a check to the church, or by texting a dollar amount to text to give at 320-289-4093. Any way that you are able to support the mission of this congregation is so greatly appreciated. We join our hearts in prayer as we pray for the church, for the world, and for all people who have needs. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you continue to bring new life into our world. This year, as we go deeper into your story, may our lives be impacted for the better in the same way as those who have gone before us. 
Gracious God, in the midst of all of the hate that comes into our world through shootings and war and racism and angry words, help us to be peacemakers. Give us the tools and the will to counter the hate in our life and in our community. Gracious God, we pray for your creation, for all that you've called good. We pray for those in this world that are living lives that are far less than, than you intend for your good creation. We pray for those who are sick in their bodies, minds, and spirits, who have asked for public prayer this day. We pray for Monica Anderson, Jane Anderson, Jean Bjorklin, Georgianne Christian, uh, Doug Deeren, Todd Ferguson, Anne Frobenius, Betsy Johnson, Don Landwehr, Heidi Larson, Linda Lokes, Kristen Markfort, Carly and Jake Mulliter. We pray for Steve Mugley. We pray for Ann Neelitz. Gracious God, we also pray for those that are grieving this day. We pray for Mary Forner on the death of her sister-in-law, Julie. Gracious God, no matter who is sick in their bodies, minds, or spirits, we ask for their healing, even if they cannot be cured. Gracious God, we offer these petitions in prayer, in thankfulness, and with confidence that they will be heard. Grant also all those other things that you see that we need. And we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now as you go from where you are to re-engage with your community, whether that is school, whether that is work, whether that's your family, take God's blessing with you. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.